This is the second lesson in the series of lessons in C++ here at s and uh, Before we get into the particulars of C++ syntax, again I'd like to talk about something a little bit more general and that is algorithms. Why algorithms? Why are they so important? Well, that's exactly what you're going to be writing when you write a program in C++. You are putting into a high-level language code which is going to implement an algorithm to solve a problem. So what do we mean by an algorithm? What's an algorithm? An algorithm is a clear, correct, concise sequence of steps that are going to solve a problem. That's exactly what you're doing when you write a program. And why is this important? Well, in C++ you have a set of, of instructions that you will use to uh, build a solution to a problem. That's all you have. You can't invent things. Uh, you have to use these elemental pieces uh, or elemental tools to build your, your solution. So you have to take your problem and break it down into smaller subsets and deal with each of these individually and sequentially and what may seem uh, a very simple thing to do uh, will require many steps in C++. So you can't just say, oh, go get the input from the user. That's not a C++ statement if it's not going to compile. You have to have the requisite uh, statement that prompts the user to input. You have to have the requisite statement that actually inputs the information, etc., etc. So hopefully when we go through this you will then start thinking in terms of taking uh, actions that you think of as being very simple and basic and tearing them down into the component parts and being able to do the same thing in your program. So let's take a look at some very simple problems. Okay, As a first example, let's write an algorithm to sort a deck of cards, standard deck of 52 cards. Now what might help you in this process is to think in terms of, well, what if I was to try and teach a four-year-old or five-year-old to do the following? I'd have to show them the cards. I'd have to explain what the goal is, that I want the cards sorted, clubs, diamonds, hearts, spades, two through ten, and then, of course, uh, jack, queen, king, and ace. So how do you do that? Well, you think it's a very simple process, and you would do it quite naturally. And you might think, well, you know, if, if I'm going to hand this to a five-year-old kid, I just tell them, sort them. But they don't understand that. You have to explain the entire process. And you might do it quite differently from the way I do it. So let's take a look at a possible solution. Okay, so we start with the deck of 52 cards, and we take the top card in turn each of the 52 cards, and we're going to create four stacks. One stack for clubs, one stack for hearts, one stack for diamond, one stack for spades. So we draw a card, it's a club, we put it down, we draw a card, it's a spade, we put it down in a different stack, draw a card, it's another club, we put it on the club stack, then a diamond, then a heart, then a spade, then a diamond, then a club, etc. Until we're done with all 52 cards and we've created four stacks of 13 cards each. Then, with each of these four stacks, we're going to order them 2 through 10, Jack, Queen, King, Ace. Then step 3, we'll combine the four stacks in this order. Club, Diamond, Heart, and Spade. And that's it. Well, is it? We've actually left out an awful lot of detail in this second step. How do you order uh, these cards, 2 through 10, Jack, Queen, King, Ace. The Jack, Queen, King, Ace is easy. Right? You identify and you put in that order. But 2 through 10, maybe we don't quite know how to do that. So, maybe that warrants another algorithm. And that, of course, is example number 2. Sorting a stack of papers, each with a number on it. This is actually a simplification of a very large problem. Sorting data. How do you put data into order? Well, it's going to depend on the key of the data that you're going to order, of course. 
uh, numbers. Well, you order according to the numerical value. Alphabetical, you order according to the alphabet. Who knows what it might be? It's the same problem that many computer scientists have, and it's a very old traditional problem. How do you sort data? Well, computer scientists, we speak of many different sorting algorithms. There is bubble sort, bucket sort, insertion sort, selection sort, uh, heap sort, quick sort, and there's more. How you might sort might be very different from how I might sort. So try to imagine that you've got a stack of papers, 30 papers, 300 papers, uh, 300,000 papers, each with a number on it. How would you sort that data? Well, let's take a look at one possible solution. Okay, and again, we want this to be clear, concise, and of course, correct. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take the top two pieces of paper off the stack, and I'll compare. The smaller of the two numbers, I'll put that piece of paper on the bottom of the stack and retain the larger two. Step two, I'm going to grab the next piece of paper off the stack and compare it to the one that I kept. The larger I will keep, the smaller I'll put at the bottom of the stack. So, step three, I'm going to repeat step two. I'm going to keep doing this until I work my way through the entire stack of papers. When I get done, I'm going to have one paper. It's going to be the largest of the entire set, and I'm going to set it aside and call it the sorted stack. Step four, then, I'm going to repeat steps one, two, and three over and over again. I'm going to do it n minus one times, where n is the number of data items in the data set, or the number of pieces of paper in that stack. I've done it once, and I'm going to do it n minus one more times, meaning I'm going to go through that stack of papers completely, so that I, on the next pass through, when I get done, I'll have the second largest piece of paper, and I'll put it on the sorted stack. Then on the third time, I have the third largest uh, valued piece of paper, and I'll put that on the sorted stack, and etc., etc. And when I get done, my sorted stack is indeed sorted. Greatest one on the bottom, next, greatest one, next to it, and so forth and so on. The smallest is on the top. What I've just described to you is called bubble sort. And again, there are many other different kinds of sorting algorithms. So here are some other exercises, some very simple things, like tying your shoes. And you might be saying, well, this is silly. It, how do I tie my shoes? I just tie them. Unless, of course, you have Velcro shoes. Well, we'll assume that you have tie shoes. Well, it's easy to you. Is it easy to a four-year-old? Probably not. How about telling time from an analog clock? Only analog clocks, sorry, digital clocks are cheating. How about if you lose your keys out on the soccer field and you have five friends to help you find them? What, what's a good way to to go through that field and find the keys. You're just going to run around at random? Probably not. But there are lots of different ways to solve that problem. When you take a problem and break it down into smaller steps and really think about what you're doing, you're bound to write or come up with a better way of solving the problem. And this is exactly what I want you to do when you're thinking of solving problems with C++. So, how does this uh, apply to coding? Well, when you're given a big problem, and I do mean a big problem, you are going to have to do that. You're going to have to take the large problem and somehow uh, model it. Now, there's lots of different ways to do this. What they taught us when I was young was control flow charts or flow charts, where we drew different boxes and circles and ovals and lines between them and I don't remember what they mean now, but as long as I was able to have a symbol for each of the different possible actions that you could use in a programming language, then I could put them together to, f to show the flow of information through uh, an algorithm, and this would help me to write proper code. Now, what I've done uh, more recently is to teach pseudocode. Pseudocode is a language that you create yourself. And again, as long as you have uh, these basic operations in every programming language, which is the input information, output information, do decision branching, and looping, you can solve anything that is actually solvable or computable. You can invent your own language, make up words, 
uh, that modeled these operations, and, and then write a sequence of statements in that pseudocode. And if you do it properly, you can then translate that into any language, like Fortran or C++ or BASIC or Pascal or whatever. But, but the idea is that you can knock the big problem down into smaller steps and understand where the process, process is going, how you're actually going to solve the problem. And that's uh, the end of this session, and I hope that you have a good understanding of the process of going from having a problem to writing code. Sometimes it's not so easy to just sit down at the keyboard and start banging away and producing C++ code. You're going to need to stop and think about what you're doing, whether you write pseudocode, write a flowchart. You really need to think about what you're doing before you jump into coding.